So many albums, so little time. And now I am starting to get requests. And so I thought for the first time ever, I will actually oblige one of them. So today we are going to review the cultural zeitgeist that is Nevermind by Nirvana. And that's about as high up as I'm going to put this because as most of you know, there is a body part on there that might get censored. I don't know how I can objectively begin to review this song or album. You know, over 30 years later, this is still a great track. Makes me wonder how many mistresses Dave Grohl had at this point in his career. I love the subtle drop of the album's title and the lyrics. I also love when the guitar solo mimics the vocal harmony from the uh, verse. Very nice touch. All three members are credited as co-writers here. Although that was not always the case. I guess only on later pressings of this album did they acknowledge that all three wrote this. I don't know what else I can say about the song. It's obviously a 10. I mean, this is probably one of the most important songs ever written. This is another major Nirvana track. It's not one of my absolute favorites, but it does have a fantastic build up to the chorus and just some great vocal delivery. It follows kind of the same pattern and, and same concepts as the previous song. Just doesn't execute it quite as well. Um, this is kind of a Dave Grohl coming out party, and I don't mean that in like a scandalous way, but I mean his drumming's really at the forefront on this track. The guitar solo here, a little bit more noise than melody, and that's okay. It's still a very good song. I'm going to give it an eight. Again, it's hit after hit. The riff to this song is like a demented, slowed down, deep fried surf rock riff. The interplay between the guitar and the bass is great. I didn't realize how great until I learned how to play this song on guitar and realized that the bass actually comes up and meets some of the lower guitar notes, which is really cool. There is a reference to Bleach here, or at least the word Bleach. Bleach, of course, being their first album which I'm sure I will review at some point. You know, he says he swears that he doesn't have a gun, but he did, or someone did in that household. Sometimes with Nirvana, you don't know how many times they're going to repeat a line. Just repeat the line until it feels right. And you're going to hear me repeating this line a lot. This song is a 10. Another great track. One of my favorite bands ever, Cave In, did a cover of this. It was fantastic. A great use of stereo panning on the guitar solo here. You don't really get that anymore. It's a great song to listen to with headphones on. I'll put it that way. It very much sounds like something that could have been on Bleach. Just some fat bass. Great distortion on that, but not too over the top. These are songs we can all relate to. Love how it has that like Mr. Brightside verse structure where they just repeat the first verse the second time. It's kind of one of Nirvana's hallmarks, and I give this a 10. You know, it's rare to have such a great sounding chorus with no words to it. We saw it done a few years later by The Offspring with self-esteem, but this really, for the alternative genre, I think is, you know the best at doing that. I love the stair step bass with like these kind of ska style riffs over it. You don't even need, like they didn't even need a different chord, chord structure for the chorus. They just made it louder and they added distortion and they just had Kurt sing nonsense over it. Was that a very small bass solo I heard in this song? I think it's a bass solo, buddy. It's another 10 for me. We're like almost halfway through the album, so we have to have this obligatory slowed down song. The lyrics to this are, are actually pretty clever. Polly wants a cracker or Polly want a cracker, but no one ever elaborates on it. Uh, Kurt Cobain did. Turned it into a whole song. If this song was on In Utero, their 1994 album, they probably would have added some like orchestral cello or other strings behind it. It does have the bass in there. It's, this isn't just a dude singing and playing guitar. Uh, there are some very mild percussion in the background. They're absolute masters of these, like, just simplistic, basic songs. Look, it's a great way to close out the first half of the album. I'll give it a 10. I'll make another Offspring reference here. Because I always thought that the guy shouting and, and reciting stuff at the beginning of this song was Dexter Holland from The Offspring. But I think it's actually the bassist. I think it's Chris Novoselic. I believe it is him that is doing like kind of the carnival barker stuff at the beginning of this song. 
I love when Kurt Cobain's vocals become just absolutely unhinged, like as they get more and more intense to where it almost sounds like he's going to lose control of his body at any point in time. It just starts deteriorating into absolute chaos. One thing that Nirvana is really good at is using feedback as an instrument. They're really good at using it in ways that aren't just noise. They do it couple times in this song to great effect it's a 10 these songs are, are are timeless and i will admit you know this song grew on me over many years and i would not have picked this as a standout song uh, by any means but it really has grown on me because it has some really unique elements to it i didn't really appreciate this until i started listening to like early Pink Floyd, but it kind of has like kind of a psychedelic like Pink Floyd vibe there's this like creepy pasta style musical bridge with like a bunch of noise and this just build up of drums it's like I'm trying to escape the back rooms I know clipped out of reality and I ended up in the bridge of drain you another demented unhinged scream to cap all that off honestly like early Foo Fighters feels like a kind of a continuation of songs like this and we obviously know how successful they are even if you take away the fact that Dave Grohl has probably like six girlfriends I will give this yet another 10. I can tell you this song, best bass line by far in the whole song. Novoselic really shines here. There's an increasing vocal intensity between each verse. He kind of gets a little bit louder, just a tad. I love how the verse goes right into the chorus seamlessly. They slip that F-bomb in there. Yes, kids, they were using F-bombs in the 90s. You got to look for it, but it's in there. Kind of reminds me of the Green Day album Insomniac, some of the songs on there, how they were just like very stripped down to just the absolute bare minimum parts needed to make the song work. As a result, I feel like this song could have done just a little bit more to make it higher, but 8 is still very, very good. This song's faster than I remember. He kind of does this like megaphone style verse kind of reminds me of some of the stuff that Scott Weiland used to do. This feels like a song you would play like in a rage room as you're just smashing stuff to pieces. It's simple. It's effective. The line, God is gay. What a conversation starter that was in the early nineties. Then the whole song just ends in chaos. Like this would have been, this would have been a solid choice for a closer. I think it's a little too repetitive for me to think it's great. I mean, it's a seven, but to me, this is my least favorite song on the album. But it's still way better than almost anything anyone was putting out at the time. This is different. I love the beck and call verse structure here. It's such hokey lyrics in a lot of senses, but the delivery of them just has so much legitimacy behind it. They may sound silly, but he's very convincing. There's not many songs where you could feature humming so prominently and kind of make it the, you know, dominant instrument at the end of a song like this. You need a great singer and you need great production for that to happen. And they did both on this. This does feel like another song that kind of leads into that early Foo Fighters sound that Dave Grohl would start working with like about four or five years later. This song is, is, is very underrated. Now the final song, kind of like a patience tester, you know, it almost sounds like the whatever the audio equivalent of writer's block is. Now they got the strings in there. They didn't want to use them for Polly. They use them here. That's good because th this song honestly needs it. This is kind of like a dry run for MTV Unplugged. It's certainly an interesting closer. It's not my favorite, but it's an eight. It's still very good, very recognizable. Here's my final verdict. I gave the songs themselves well over a nine average. So congrats there. The sequencing, a little bit below average. I don't want to say it falls apart at the end because that would be a lie, but it does feel like they, they shifted all of the tracks that weren't as good towards the end. I think it kind of ends a little bit too slow. I think maybe it would have been better to switch something in the way in Polly if you wanted to end on a slower, softer song. The aesthetic, I'm simply going to give this a three and I will tell you why. Um, I don't like the fact that there is a naked baby on the front of it. It has always made me uncomfortable. And also, like, the album to me doesn't really have much of a visual or thematic identity. Um, it's just a collection of really great songs. There's no concept that unifies it other than the fact that it became really, really popular, which, you know, they had no control over. The production's fantastic. I know that Nirvana was 
thought that the production and mixing was a little too heavy handed and they scaled it back a lot for their follow up album. But I think without the production and the mixing the way it was, this album would not have been as huge of a success. Reminds me of Pearl Jam's first album in that way. And it's no surprise why a lot of these songs became radio hits because they sound great. For early 90s albums, this is off-the-charts production quality. My hat's off to Butch Vig and the band. This is a 10 for me. And that brings me to an 82 total. I mean, I've listened to this album to death over the years, had it shortly after it first came out. I definitely know this album front to back, as do many people who grew up in that era. Looking at it with a critical lens, yeah, I give it an 82, and I feel pretty good about that score. Because I think it's a really, really good album. Um, Certainly one of my favorites from that era. Well, that puts a stake in the heart of yet another John Wyatt Edgar album review. We made it to 10 episodes. I feel pretty good about that. So keep watching and keep telling me how terrible this, this show is.